Dear friends, uh, thank you everyone for taking the time from your Sunday evening to participate in this fireside. Our theme for this evening is the law, justice, and the advancement of communities. It's a very special pleasure for us to introduce our speaker this evening, Laylee Miller Moreau, founder and chief executive officer of the Tahereh Justice Center. The Tahereh Justice Center stands alone as the only national multi-city organization in the United States that provides a broad range of direct legal and social services, uh, policy advocacy, and training and education to protect immigrant women and girls fleeing violence. Laylee established the Tahereh Justice Center in 1997 after she was involved in a high profile case that set national precedent and really revolutionized asylum law in the United States. Laylee was an attorney uh, at the law firm of Arnold and Porter, where she practiced international litigation and maintained a substantial pro bono practice. Prior to joining Arnold and Porter, Laylee was an attorney advisor at the US Department of Justice. Laylee is a frequent lecturer and has appeared on numerous news outlets, including CNN, Fox News, The New York Times, NPR, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. Thank you very much for sharing this evening with us, Laylee. I've been um, just enjoying myself randomly admitting people. Is that, I don't know, am I supposed to do that or is that a it's task? Fine. No, you don't need to do anything. That's being <laughs> taken care of in the weight room and I saw that I had power over that so I just went ahead and admitted people but feel free to take that back over from me. Um, uh, so, um, so we are going to talk about justice tonight and um, before I dive into that I want to give um, a strong disclaimer that it, rooted in what the Baha'i Faith is. So um, in the Baha'i Faith as many of you know that the, we don't have clergy and in fact the belief in the Baha'i faith is that each individual needs to investigate truth for themselves to determine for themselves what truth is and so inherent in that is that we all bring uh, to our own understanding of the Baha'i writings and concepts in the Baha'i faith our own limitations our own weaknesses our own um, lack of knowledge and ignorance and then we bring perspective and the wisdom that we do have to it and so what I'm going to share with you is my understanding of the Baha'i concept of justice and I really don't think I get it I don't think I understand it I think there is a tremendous amount still to unpack it's a very complex concept in the Baha'i faith um, and so I will do my best to offer the piece of it that I've been grappling with. But, um, but, but I say that because if you were investigating the Baha'i Faith, I would encourage you to read for yourself uh, some of the writings that I'm going to um, cite for us. Read the long chapters, only pieces of which I'm going to mention. There's so much there and there's so much to investigate. So I would really encourage people to do that and, and derive their own meanings from it. But, um, my perspective on what justice might look like as it's informed by the Baha'i writings um, has to do with my work at the Tahereh Justice Center and uh, Vafa mentioned that my day job is to work with a nonprofit organization that provides free legal services. We provide free legal defense for women and girls who are fleeing human rights abuses. So our clients are from all over the world. They're from um, uh, Latin America, Central America. They're from Africa, the Middle East, um, Asia, South Asia, Eastern Europe, different, different parts of the world. And all of our clients are facing extreme forms of violence. Um, some of them are facing female genital mutilation, child marriage, uh, honor crimes, domestic violence, human trafficking. There's a wide variety of forms of violence that they face. <clears throat> and what we do at the Tahari Justice Center is we try to provide them, uh, we do provide them free legal defense. And we do that uh, by providing holistic services. So we also have social services staff that work with our attorneys 
so that our clients can rebuild their lives and live lives with dignity. All of our clients are courageous in their own right. They're standing up against violence that perhaps their mother endured, their mother's mother endured. Um, and so it's, it's often multiple generations of violence that they're standing up against. And so by their courage, they're acting as change agents. You know, many of us in our own families had a mother, a grandmother, a, a great grandmother who said no to what was very common and very normal and very expected. And by her act of courage, it changed the trajectory um, for our families. Um, almost everyone has relatives in their families that have done this. Tahereh's clients are that for the women and their family. And so um, we, we feel that it's a great honor and privilege to support them in, in their courageous moments so that they can transform their communities. Many of them are changing not only their lives and their families' lives, but also their cultures. Um, we've had clients who have helped to end female genital mutilation in their villages. They've helped end cycles of domestic violence in their family. They've ended child and forced marriage for them and all of their cousins. So it is, yes, about helping them, but it's also about transforming society. In terms of the scale of the Tahare Justice Center, we are located, uh, we're limited in the United States. And I mention that because I know that there are a lot of folks from Canada um, on this call. And unfortunately, we don't have offices in Canada. We're limited in our work by legal jurisdictions. So we are in the United States. Um, we have over 100 full-time paid staff at Tahare. Um, we're in five offices or five cities, Houston, Texas, San Francisco, Atlanta, Washington, DC, and Baltimore. Um, and at any given moment in time, we're litigating around 2,000 cases. We also engage in public policy advocacy. Uh, we work in Washington, DC, where I live, um, on legislative change, policy change, that kind of thing, to make sure that justice is systematically available. Um, so that's the nature of my work. Um, for professional reasons, maybe obviously, I've been interested in trying to understand the Baha'i concept of justice. Um, but like all of us, I also have had uh, personal experiences um, that have made me search deep around questions of justice. And among the things I learned was that you can't talk about justice in the Baha'i faith without also talking about forgiveness. So we'll discuss um, both of those concepts. But the, the Baha'i faith essentially believes that the world we're living in right now um, is a time of judgment, that we are living in judgment day the judgment day that was prophesized by many of many religions, including Christianity, but not only Christianity. And Baha'is believe that that spiritual time has begun and that spiritual time for humanity to be judged, for humanity to experience the, the chastening fires of tests and ordeals that will help us turn to God, will help us purify who we are, um, fix, the problems, the injustices that we have had are now. And Baha'u'llah, when he came in the mid 1800s, declared that this was the time that we were living in. Um, I know that the reality of these things in Canada may be a little different, but from what I've read among the news, it's a global phenomenon, but you all know that the United States is uh, drowning in injustice right now. And it's painful. It's super, super painful. It's painful um, in the law, uh, in the systems where I work. It's also painful between people because there is pain that has been held by Black people, First Nations people, um, uh, migrant people from all over who have faced for too long oppression and persecution. And it's erupting and it's it's due, it's right, it's time, but it's, it's painful. A friend of mine was um, helping me understand in, in a context that she had. In the Baha'i faith, um, we're told that uh, this process of humanity transforming is a process of disintegration and integration. So we believe that 
humanity will dismantle systems and things will disintegrate that don't work anymore. And that we will be building up um, new ways of doing things that are rooted in the Baha'i faith and guided by the teachings of Baha'u'llah. And we're told that that process will be a lot like birth, the birthing process. And the birthing process is um, painful. It's super, super painful. I've had three children um, and it really is painful and it's, it's unpredictable. It, it speeds up, it slows down, it's hard to know, are you near the end? Are we just near the beginning? This, you know, there's a whole lot that's unpredictable about that. But it's also true that the more intense the pain is and the more frequent it is, the closer we are to the birth of something wonderful. Um, and so we can look around us and see these, these forces at work. Um, a friend of mine was telling me though about her childbirth. Now I, I, had, I had a different experience because I kind of tend to bring my pain like inward. <laughs> I get like really quiet and inward. Um, but she expressed it differently. And she ex ex shared with me that I think she like bit her husband. She spat at him. She said she brought up stuff that didn't even really matter that much to her. But in that moment, <laughs> she like brought it. It was real spiteful. She was saying things she later regretted, all these things. And, um, and, and it's interesting because she was sharing this with me because she was explaining, you know, if we really are going through a birthing process, the odds are really good that not everyone is going to be in complete control of all their faculties during it. <laughs> like it's a very normal expected thing that we might bite someone that we regret later. We might spit on someone that, that we, you know, need to apologize for later or whatever it may be. So birth is hard and this is what the process um, that humanity is going through right now. Um, but you know, in the last few weeks, it's been really, really intense. Um, Baha'u'llah tells us that this is the, the day of judgment, as I mentioned, and specifically he says, justice in this day bewailing its plight and equity groaneth beneath the yoke of oppression. Thick clouds of tyranny have darkened the face of the earth and enveloped its people. Through the movement of our, plan, our pen of glory, we have at the bidding of the omnipotent ordainer breathed a new life into every human frame and instilled into every word a fresh potency. All created things proclaim the evidences of this worldwide regeneration. This is the most great, the most joyful tidings imparted by the pen of this wronged one to mankind. Wherefore fear ye, O my well-beloved ones? Who is it that could dismay you? A touch of moisture sufficeth to dissolve the hardened clay out of which this perverse generation is molded. The mere act of your gathering together is enough to scatter the forces of these vain and worthless people. So Baha'u'llah warns us that this is a hard time <laughs> and, and, and one that is fraught with injustice and inequity. Um, but then we're also comforted to know that we have nothing to fear, that things will go in their due course, that the world will transform as it is supposed to, um, but we have to do our job in, in helping things move along. So justice, why is it so important? Um, I am going to try to share my screen right now. Let me, oh, nope. Sorry, bear with me. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Are you seeing my screen? It says the purpose of justice. Yes. Yeah, we are. Great, great, great. Okay. So then let me fix this real quick. Okay. 
So we are told in the Baha'i writings that the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity. Now, uh, something, a, a linguistic translation point that's very, very important. Um, I don't speak the language that this was originally uh, written in, but I asked someone who did, because in, in English, the word appearance has two meanings. Appearance can mean um, the, the facade of something, like I'm just going to appear unified, for example, or it can mean the gradual creation, the emergence of something, the appearance of something. And there's a huge difference in those two meanings. Um, I was told that this word in this context, in the language in which it was written, is the same word used to describe the rising of the sun in the morning. So what that tells me is that the, the meaning of this word is the appearance the emergence of something, not just the pretend appearance or facade. So we know that the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity among men. So what that tells us is that unity isn't possible without justice. Justice's purpose is so that unity can appear. And this is very important because justice doesn't feel like unity. For most of the process of justice, it does not feel like unity. In fact, it feels hard because it involves a lot of courage to speak out against an injustice. It feels embarrassing because you may be the only one who's willing to speak. It is traumatic because you're hearing about something that you didn't know about or you thought maybe didn't exist. It's offensive because you're the one that's just been told that you've been acting unjust and you thought you were a great person. And so it's hard to hear that and receive that. There's in a justice process, there's usually a truth finding uh, stage. And that's super hard in court. You have witnesses, the witnesses disagree. They're gonna be different views of the same thing, but that's necessary to derive the truth. Then in a justice process after truth has been decided, you can decide to appeal that truth or accept that truth. You can live in that vortex for a little while. Then once the truth has been determined, there is a stage where punishment is decided. That's super hard because then you're talking about options, you're talking about what's gonna be effective, what in fact is gonna matter, how can we change the behavior, how can we adequately it's, that's also really hard, doesn't feel like unity yet. And, and then there is the implementation of consequences of punishment. Then there's the implementation of the punishment. That's also super hard and can take years. Then there's a point at which justice has happened. And, and I think a lot of us think it ends there. But the reality is if the process, of, the purpose of the process of justice is the appearance of unity, then it, it continues. It continues towards the process of unity. Um, I am gonna give you um, another visual. Let's see. Okay. So do you see a chart in front of you? Okay. So this is not holy. This is my <laughs> image <laughs> of what justice might look like in, in the Baha'i writings. Um, and there is a process of justice. One of the things that we're told in the Baha'i writings is a quotation that says that, lo that love cannot dwell in a heart possessed by fear. Okay, so we're told love cannot dwell in a heart possessed by fear. Now, it is true that some people are superhuman and they can be faced with injustice and not have their heart possessed by fear. Martin Luther King was an incredible example of that. He could look pain in the face and not be possessed by fear. There are some people who can do that, but a lot of mere mortals feel when they, they are possessed by fear when they face injustice. And so, what this is, is trying to illustrate is a process of justice that involves the community and the individual. Because in the Baha'i writings, we're told that justice involves different players who play different roles, and it's not up to the victim 
to implement justice. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be up to the victim to implement justice. So I am going to come back to this chart, but the main thing that I wanted to explain now is that where it begins with oppression, there are many, many, many stages until we actually get to the pillar of justice, at which point it will be easier for fear to not be at play and it will be easier for love to enter our hearts and then it will be easier for reconciliation for restitution and for unity but it's this long arc and particularly in the u.s justice system anyway the main objective of it is winning it's not justice it's winning and and so what people think of as justice is only when punishment happens and we don't conceive of what happens after punishment, the restoration of a relationship, the restoration of someone's soul, the transformation of their behavior, the transformation of a system. And these are all things that also have to happen in a process of justice. So I'm gonna um, uh, go back quickly to, okay. So, I want to focus on this quotation when talking about this concept of justice that deals with the individual and with community. Um, so we have an actually wait, no, I'm not ready for that one yet. Let me, I'm going to move it back really quickly. Okay. Okay. So we're told in the Baha'i faith that there's a very definite distinction between the duty of an individual to forgive and even to be killed rather than kill, and then the duty of society to uphold justice. Okay, so the duty of community to uphold justice is very, very clear. And there are a lot of Baha'i writings that talk about this. Um, here are just a few quotations, but we're told that if we don't stay the hand of the oppressor, uh, if we fail to safeguard the rights of the downtrodden, what right have we to vaunt ourselves among men? We're also told to tell the rich of the midnight sighing of the poor, to make sure that those who live with privilege are not ignorant to the inequity, the suffering, and the pain of those who have less. Um, and we're also told that if criminals were entirely forgiven, the order of the world would be upset. So punishment is one of the essential necessities for the safety of communities. And then we're told, but the individual has no right of vengeance. On the contrary, one who is a victim should forgive and pardon. And now I'm going to get into, oh, well, no, actually, so forgiveness. So as individuals, though, the bar is very high and hard to swallow. And I don't know anybody, and I will not pretend, <laughs> and I definitely don't know anybody who's achieved this aspiration. But this aspiration of forgiveness in the Baha'i writings is not unique to the Baha'i faith. It's in Christianity. Christ talked a lot about it. It's in Buddhism, it's in Hinduism, it's in all the world religions and all the faiths that as individuals, we need to forgive even the most grievous of sins. Um, so there are many, many, many quotes, but just a, a couple of my favorites. Um, if a person falls into error a hundred thousand times, he may yet turn his face to you hopeful that you will forgive his sins. For he must not become hopeless, neither grieved nor despondent. This is the conduct and the manner of the people of Baha. Um, I read this quotation to a friend of mine who's not a Baha'i, and she said, so are you keeping a tick list? Like, she wondered if I was counting, you know, because she said, because I, I count, and if somebody's wronged me five times, I'm done. They're not my friend anymore. <laughs> like, I cut them out completely. And she's like, y'all have to wait a hundred thousand times. And I was like, yeah, that's yeah that's a lot isn't it you know but how many of us have um not waited a hundred thousand times and had less patience maybe with somebody who had wronged us or who had done something we viewed as unforgivable 
We're told that we must look upon our enemies with a sin covering eye and act with justice when confronted with any injustice whatsoever. Forgive all, consider the whole of humanity as our own family, the whole earth as our own country. We're also told, wherefore must the loved ones of God associate in affectionate fellowship with stranger and friend alike, showing forth to all the utmost loving kindness, disregarding the degree of their capacity, never asking whether they deserve to be loved. In every instance, let the friends be considerate and infinitely kind. Let them never be defeated by the malice of the people, by their aggression and their hate, no matter how intense. If others hurl darts against you, offer them milk and honey in return. If they poison your lives, sweeten their souls. If they injure you, teach them how to be comforted. If they inflict a wound upon you, be a balm to their sores. If they sting you, hold to their lips a refreshing cup. And then, you know, the, the, the next quote is very similar. Um, so if people are mean to us, we're supposed to be nice, <laughs> basically. And this is the standard in the Baha'i faith and, and in all religions. And so how do we reconcile that with justice? How do we bring the two concepts together? And how do we have unity? Because we can't have unity without justice. Okay, so there is a chapter and, and what, I, what I have done is I have shamelessly cut and pasted from the chapter. And um, it, it, it's, it's a, a, a chapter in a book called Some Answered Questions. And it's the chapter on the treatment of criminals. And um, what I have cut and pasted here is, it's about a five page chapter that really describes in great detail. So um, I suggest that you uh, read the whole thing. And, um, but here are some salient points for uh, our discussion later. And, and also I have taken out, there was a very long Arabic name and I simply bracketed it just for ease of reading. Um, if someone oppresses, injures, or wrongs another, and the wronged man retaliates, this is vengeance and it is censurable. No, rather he must return good for evil and not only forgive, but also if possible be of service to his oppressor. This is hard stuff. This is really hard stuff. But the community has the right of defense and of self-protection. Moreover, the community has no hatred, no animosity for the murderer. It imprisons or punishes him merely for the protection and security of others. It is not for the purpose of taking vengeance upon the murderer, but for the purpose of inflicting a punishment by which the community will be protected. As forgiveness is one of the attributes of the merciful one, so also is justice one of the attributes of the Lord. The tent of existence is upheld upon the pillar of justice, not forgiveness. So he compares them directly, their importance, to society and for community. The continuance of mankind depends on justice, not forgiveness. To recapitulate the constitution of communities depend on, like if we didn't get it, he mentions it several times throughout this chapter. The constitution of communities depends upon justice, not forgiveness, but the communities must protect the rights of man. So if someone assaults, injures, oppresses, and wounds me, I will offer no resistance and I will forgive him. But if a person wishes to assault, and, and this is, there's a name, so, so and so, certainly I will prevent him. Although for the malefactor, non-interference is apparently a kindness, it would be an oppression to you. If at this moment, so and so were to enter this place with a drawn sword, wishing to assault, wound, and kill you, but most assuredly I would prevent him. 
If I abandon you, that would not be justice, but injustice. But if he injure me personally, I will forgive him. So this is the paradigm in the Baha'i faith. And this is a paradigm that flies in the face of our culture. This is not our culture. We do not have a culture around this. We don't have a culture of forgiveness. We, and, and, and it's embedded in our movies, our entertainment, our own therapists. There, there's very, there's a, a really high bar for forgiving people. Lots of hoops, lots of conditions, lots of requirements. And this level of unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness is foreign. It's very foreign to us. Similarly, this concept of allyship and advocacy and intervention and witnessing and stepping up and stepping into injustice is also completely foreign to our culture. Many of us come from cultures that are honor-based, where shame and embarrassment is very important to avoid for our families and for ourselves. And so what that does is it prevents us from speaking up, from acting like we notice, to, to recognizing an injustice, to saying something about it, to even offering help to someone else. Um, you know, much of America, and I know Canada has the same genetics, came from Britain. And there was a, or still is actually, a Northern European stiff upper, upper lift, upper lip, uh, don't cry, don't let anyone know you need, don't let anyone know you, you need help or that you're weak or that you have anything that might be embarrassing. Some of us come from cultures where um, dishonoring your family has very, very severe consequences. And so all of these cultural histories that we all hold prevent us often from looking injustice in the eye and saying, I see that. I'm not going to act like I don't see it. I see it, and I'm going to ask if you need help, and I'm going to help, and I'm going to do something, and I'm going to say something. I mean, you know, I, I, I've been in a grocery store, and I have seen a child, like, I, I remember there was this one moment we were in, um, we were in a mall. It was in a food court in a mall. And my, my children were very little at the time. I was with all three of them. My husband wasn't around. My youngest was kind of on my hip. He was an infant. And then I had a three-year-old and a six-year-old. And um, a man was abusing his child in the food court. And it was such an interesting process to watch. Because in the beginning, most people began to do this. There was embarrassment. Like people didn't want to look at it. <laughs> Like as if they couldn't see, it was so public, it was happening right in the food court in the small. And a lot of people started to do this and a lot of people were looking down. I watched several families grab their children even though they hadn't finished eating and shepherd them away from the situation. There was this you know, instinct to don't ask, don't tell, don't notice and run <laughs> like as, as fast as you could. Then there were a few people who began taking out their phones and began filming this father. And then that was interesting because that made him very angry. And he began yelling at the people who were filming him. He was not from our country and his English wasn't great. And I, my heart was beating so fast. I remember in that moment thinking, what do I do? And I was trying to think of the writings and I was thinking of my children and should we, should I engage in like self-preservation behavior? Should I engage in, I don't want to embarrass that person behavior. Um, what I, what I ended up doing is I, I, nobody was approaching this family. No one was actually intervening. They were either filming or they were running away from the situation. Um, but I ended up walking up to him and I had my baby on my hip and, and I said to him, do you know why people are filming you? And he said, they need to, something about they need to mind their own business, you know. And I said, because you are being abusive and you are violent and it is shocking to watch you. And I, and I, I basically said to him, this is what is happening right now. And some people may be calling the police right now because this is a crime. And he kind of, it, it was an interesting engagement because 
he looked shocked. And then I looked over and his wife was hiding under her, her chador. And, um, and then I turned to her and I, I realized she was a bit in danger. I didn't want to say something to her that might cause problems for her. I still don't know if I handled it right. I, and, and I don't know what happened. It was one of those really difficult moments. So I share it, not to say that it was handled perfectly, but only to say that I know we are all in those moments. We've had those moments. All of us have had those moments. And what the writings say to me is that we can't look away that we can't walk away, that we can't act like it's not happening um, because we're, hold, we're held to a higher standard. And, and don't get me wrong, when, when we intervene, don't expect appreciation. Don't expect easy engagement. Don't expect to not put yourself at risk or to be um, that person to be grateful to you who you're trying to help. Because odds, in fact, will be very good that the person that you're seeking to help is embarrassed that you noticed. Because no one wants to be a victim. It's hugely embarrassing. Um, there was a case of a woman uh, in a Baha'i community, actually. And a member of the local spiritual assembly reached out to me by phone and said, I don't know much about domestic violence, but I'm seeing something that makes me think that I might be seeing domestic violence. Can you help me think it through? And she described a woman who didn't speak English very well, who had just arrived in the country, who um, when she first came to feast was very happy and had a very um, uh, upright posture. And over time, her posture began to change. She was kind of huddled. She was hiding. She was smaller. She also didn't look well. She looked unhealthy. And um, this person began to notice that her husband would follow her from room to room and he wouldn't leave her alone or allow her to talk to anyone without him next to her. And, you know, in this person, that's all the data this person had. And, and I said to her, you know, I don't know, um, but it, it can't hurt to try to help. The first rule to helping someone who you think is facing an injustice is to increase proximity. That's the first rule. So this, and, and Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Institute, and he wrote this amazing book called Just Mercy, a, book, a movie was just made of it. He talks about increasing proximity. Um, we want to help indigenous people live on a reservation. You want to help African Americans and Black people have intimate, close, authentic friendships. With, with Black and, and African American people. Um, if you think that someone is, is being, uh, if they're being yelled at on a metro or on a subway, walk up and be physically next to them. Give them eye contact, let them know that you're a friend and ask if they need help. So don't take their power away, don't take their agency away, but increase proximity, really understand their needs and be in a better place to help. So with this one uh, case, um, what she did was I, I suggested to her as a woman that she come up to her and say, you know, essentially, I have a woman issue. I'm wondering if you could follow me to the bathroom and help me out with this issue. And she did that and that allowed her to get away from her husband. So she took her to the restroom and just said, you know, um, I want to give you my cell phone. And I just want to let you know that if you ever need help, I will help you. And I love you and there's no judgment and I, I will help you. Not surprisingly, this person's first reaction was shame. It was, I don't need help. I don't know what you're talking about. Everything is fine. That was her first reaction because her instinct was embarrassment that she wasn't hiding it well enough. It was embarrassment that somebody else noticed that she might need help. That's very normal. That's very, very normal. And so it took time, it took trust, it took the development of an authentic relationship. And the person did confide in her. He was arrested. There was a very, unfortunately, public trial. And the prosecutor of the state of the city at this, uh, in this case said that it was the worst case of really sadistic sexual violence that he had ever experienced in his 20 years as a prosecutor. This woman needed help and she got help because someone noticed and then increased proximity 
lovingly, without taking her power, without taking her agency or engaging in saviorism, was by her side and helped. And also in this case, it, it was a very, it made me very proud that the, the local spiritual assembly in this instance sat in the trial in the courtroom during the entire proceedings to support her. And, and there was a great deal of support that was given. But that process of justice wasn't pretty. It was embarrassing for his family and for the community. And it was painful. It didn't look like unity for a lot of the process. But it, when there is justice, then there can be true unity. And so we have to endure the process of truth, of punishment, of implementation of punishment, so that fear can leave our hearts so we don't have to live in fear and then we're, we're not possessed by fear so that love is possible and then when that happens we can have unity and reconciliation and and all of these things so it's this it's this arc it's this whole process um justice doesn't happen like this and unity doesn't just happen because we decide it's a good thing or <laughs> we just decide we just want to be unified we have to go through the work we have to go through the tunnel of justice in order to get to the other side of of unity and it's super painful it's super painful because it means looking at ourselves in the mirror it might mean looking at others more closely systems as well as individuals and and it's a really 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 painful 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 yucky birthing process through which some people might bite and spit and hit but we have to get through it in order to ultimately have unity and and to have the birth of a new civilization one that is rooted in justice which we're told is the day that we're living in so um i'm realize i'm past my time uh so i will stop and ask if there are questions or things that people want to discuss um I'll stop the sharing. So thank you, uh, thank you, lady. I I thought we were only about 10, 15 minutes into it, personally. Um, thanks very much. Uh, that was uh, great, and particularly, I think the the part about um, the role that us as individuals can have, because often it's difficult to understand what specifically I can do in a given situation as opposed to uh, you know feeling disempowered or or uh, disabled to actually engage and involve in a situation um, i'm sure there's there's going to be a, a fair amount of questions friends just to uh, let you know um, on zoom there's a feature that you can raise your hand uh, because there's almost 80 connections and more people uh, on, I'm going to ask that you uh, raise your hands digitally, and then I will call on you uh, in in order, uh, so that we can have uh, some discipline to how we ask our uh, questions. So uh, please feel free to raise your hands, and and uh, I'd be happy to call on you. And at that time, we'll unmute and uh, and move forward. So. Uh, we've got a bunch of hands coming up. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jacques Jean if you would like to um, go ahead and ask your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this is a great conversation. And um, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Darren for inviting me. Uh, my name is Jacques, and I'm from Haiti. And we in Haiti, we got our independence in 1804, right after the United States. In order for us to get there, to get the independence that we were looking for, we had to fight for that independence. So if we look at today, 2020, we're talking about justice, but at the same time, when we think about the Christianity or invoking Christianity within the word of justice, Christianity as the one that brought us here 
from a suffering perspective, from a religious perspective, how we as a people, Haitians or black as a people, it is so painful hearing someone talk about injustice when injustice has been a book since 400 years and no one dared to say anything about injustice. And today there's a wave, obviously because of technology, that allowed us to see the pain, the atrocity that have been caused to, eat to, to us as Black people. Finally, the younger generations understand and then raise their voice. And that voice, that pain is not only physical. It in the corporate world and the corporate board, it's in the churches, it's everywhere. I tried my best to really understand how to use that forgiveness and everything that is related to a spiritual, which I know I'm not good enough to really get there, but I tried my best. I have most of my friends are white. Most of my friends are from other culture because I live in a lot of other countries that are non-white. I'd like you to really help me understand how do I get there? Because after seeing that video of Floyd, after seeing all of the things that are happening in the world, even in the corporate world, what the religion, what the Christianity have done to some people like just myself, how rival to America, I'd like you to help me understand how can we as a people, not as a black man, Asian, Hispanic, white, how can we truthfully get out of that painful without accepting the first steps or acknowledging the first step of that atrocity that was causing to the Black people? Thank you. Thank you. It, it, that's a, such an important question. Such an important question. And um, I, I'm not going to pretend to know the answer to it. What I will attempt to do, but probably imperfectly, is to share my understanding from the Baha'i writings on two fronts to this question. Because one has to do with us as individuals, the other has to do with society. And those are two different processes. Um, because there are injustices in society that have bitten into the moral fiber and into the structures that we live with every day. There's the personal. There's how does Jacques forgive? How does Lely forgive? There's the personal, and we can also talk about that. But there's also the societal, because uh, in the Baha'i writings, as, as you saw in these quotations, Justice is more important than forgiveness for the well-being of society. So when it, become, it comes to the institutions in society, we're told very clearly that justice is the pillar that holds up the tent of civilization. And so we have to have justice in society. As a lawyer, I can tell you that the entire justice system in the United States, and I know that Canada has a common law, we have a civil system, it's a little bit different, but we both inherited it from the British. And the, the justice system that we inherited was by design from its inception racist, sexist, and classist. It was only ever meant to protect white, wealthy men. That was the design. And it's not like a conspiracy theory. It's fact. <laughs> you can read history. You can look at the original design. It's not even, it's fact. So this is the justice system that we have inherited. And the way that it was built 
you know, if we imagine that the justice system is a building, for example, it was poured with concrete, the foundation of it was white supremacy, patriarchy, all of these things. It was meant to keep, keep rich people rich, to keep white people in charge, and to keep men on top. This is what it was designed to do. Then over in the United States anyway, uh, since this justice system uh, became more and more instituted a few hundred years, what we've done is we've added some additions. We've, you know, we've put some constitutional amendments in there in the United States. We've added some additions. We've changed the plumbing. We realized the electrical system was a little bit old. Like we've done all of these things on this building of justice that was poured with the concrete of, of, of racism and sexism and, and classism. We've tried to fix it. We've tried to amend it. We've seen cracks, we've tried to spackle and paint them over. We've realized additions were needed, more people had to be included, and we've done all of these different things. The problem is that doesn't work. You, you, you cannot, there's a quotation uh, from the House of Justice that says you cannot graft on to a fundamentally flawed system piecemeal solutions. It actually doesn't work. And so, at least in the United States right now, I would argue that we're seeing the undoing of this. We're seeing the unraveling of this. Finally, it's long overdue because our justice system is based on who wins, not the truth. The judge, for example, is not allowed to ask questions. Only the lawyers can ask questions. So even if the judge knows that someone is being poorly represented, the judge cannot inject themselves and ask more questions and try, because truth is not his job. It's just winning. That's the job. And you will only win if you have a lawyer, and you will only win if you have a good lawyer, and you will only get a good lawyer if you have a ton of money. So the justice system is not based on truth. It's not based on justice. It's based on winning, and that in turn is based on how much money you have. That whole thing has to be blown up. There's no way that we can ever have justice in a society if justice is not a right, if truth is not the objective. If winning is the objective and money is how you get there, we'll never ever have a just system. So I would say when it comes to the injustices that are systemic, forgiveness is not important. Truth and fixing it and changing it and justice punishment, all of these elements that were talked about in the Baha'i writings, that's what's important to fixing society. Okay, now as an individual, we do have to forgive as individuals. And so that's like a separate analysis. Some of us need therapy for that. Sometimes we need to take a lot of deep breaths for that and that kind of thing. And for some, religion is helpful. Now, I want to speak to a very important point I think you made, which is that religion has been used as a source of evil again and again and again throughout society. And there is no sugarcoating that. It's absolutely true. Christianity was used as justification for slavery. And, and other religions have also been used to justify horrible things. But this is the thing. Anything that has great capacity for good has an equal and opposite capacity for bad. So for example, medicine, and I'm not a doctor, I'm sure there's some here who know more than I do, but medicine is an incredible thing when used right, when used according to the prescription of the physician in its appropriate dosage, in its appropriate measure, and at its appropriate time. And medicine can be a great source of healing. However, it has an equal and opposite capacity to murder, to kill, to poison and that kind of thing. It doesn't make it less potent for positive. It only means that it has to be in the right hands and it has to be used for the right purpose and at the right time. And religion arguably has a very similar capacity. People will sacrifice and do great things for a higher power. People will be guided, their morals and their values will be uplifted. Their behaviors can be radically transformed for the better. People have done amazing transformative things when called by religion. 
it is also true <laughs> that people will kill other people in the name of religion and will justify horrible things in the name of religion, but it doesn't make religion less potent. The Baha'i faith actually very specifically talks about um, this kind of use and misuse of religion and, and says if it's used as a force for bad, it would be better not to have it at all because it's so powerful and it must be used for good. And then on this medicine analogy, in the Baha'i writings, the, the, the Baha'i faith believes that God progressively reveals teachings and gives guidance to humanity throughout history. Kind of like um, as an individual, when we grow, we need new lessons. We need to know how to apply certain concepts in new situations as we grow and as we mature and as we think in more complex ways. And so we believe that humanity is very similar and thousands of years ago, we may have only had certain scientific capacity, certain socio-political capacity. We viewed the world in certain ways and God's teachers taught us in ways that were relevant to that time and that place in history um, to help humanity evolve in the ways we needed. So almost like you know, a first grade teacher will be teaching a first grader in the way they need to learn. And then your 10th grade teacher teaches you in a different way, but they don't contradict. Like you would never say, oh, my 10th grade teacher is inherently superior to my first grade teacher. That would be a ridiculous thing to say. But what would be true is to say that they are teaching me differently because I have different capacity. So Baha'is believe in all the prophets of all the religions because they were all relevant to their students at the time. And we believe that Baha'u'llah has brought the message for today and gives us the laws and the teachings to help us apply things to current issues and current problems. Um, it is true like medicine and, and, and the Baha'i writings, the Baha'u'llah talks about God being the divine physician and sending the prescription for what humanity needs. And the thing about medicine is the very same prescription that worked perfectly for an ailment if it sits on the shelf for too long, it becomes impotent. If it sits on the shelf for longer, it actually can become a poison, in fact. And you know, if you have a prescription and you got it from the drugstore for a certain ailment, you didn't use it all, it sat there, and then you waited 10 years and said, this feels like the same disease that I had 10 years ago, and you grab that same medicine. That same medicine that was a source of healing 10 years ago can actually be a source of poison then. It's no longer relevant. The, it, the, the bacteria has mutated. The medicine has gone stale, whatever it may be. We believe religion is the same way. And religion not renewed can in fact be harmful because we're applying lessons that were intended for humanity thousands of years ago. And it is not the same lesson that we need today. Um, and on that point, I want to, sorry, this, you asked such a great question and you've set me off, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking because I'm sure that there are other um, e equally brilliant questions. But I just want to share with you two things before we go. One has to do um, with forgiveness and the other has to do with racism. On the subject of forgiveness, what I would say as an individual, and this is just very personal, um, in recent years there has been a situation of um, um, the worst kind of injustice. And um, as a family, we're realizing there will likely never be justice in a courtroom. Um, and, and so, and so we're, we're, you know, we're having to absorb that. And something about this journey to justice that I didn't talk about is the fact that justice is not limited to this earthly plane. Justice is not limited to what we see and we experience here on earth. We believe that when we die, our soul continues and we, our mortal frame is left, this material existence is left, and there are other worlds of God. Some call them heaven, you know, different things like that. The Baha'is believe there are other spiritual realities that we enter into. And, um, and we're told that if justice is not administered, adequately in this life, then the justice that will be administered by God in the next will be a hundredfold worse. There's a particular tablet that talks about if I steal a seed from you, 
I have to pay you back this week. Um, it, it uses this phrase, uh, recompense. Want to go to the recompense? Um, and uh, um, I don't know. If, okay, he muted himself. So the idea is that if I steal a seed from you, I have to pay you back the seed, not because you've asked for it, because you've forgiven me, right? Like if you're doing this this perfect level of forgiveness, so I'm not paying you the seed because you've asked for it. Um, I am giving you back the seed as a debt to society. It has to do with this community responsibility for justice. If I fail to pay you back that seed, then what I owe to community in the next life is the equivalent of not just the seed, but the tree from the seed, its branches, its leaves, its fruits, and those seeds. So on a bad day, I almost wish that there won't be justice in this life. <laughs> in a bad day, like it's a bit vengeful and probably not the way it's supposed to be. I, I recognize that the justice that will happen in the next life will be even more severe. And on some level that gives um, me comfort when it comes to this particular situation of injustice. But um, the, the other thing that I wanted to share is just uh, the Baha'i view on racism, which I think is, is very important and that of course, is a whole nother multiple evenings <laughs> discussion that won't be had adequately here. Um, but we are told we have very specific roles to fix justice. And um, I think it's worth repeating even for people who have heard this before. Um, but we're told that white people in particular have a higher burden and a larger responsibility for fixing this because we caused it. And so there's this burden. And so in the Baha'i writings, it says specifically, let the white make a supreme effort in their resolve to contribute their share to the solution of this problem, to abandon once and for all their usually inherent and at, sub, at times subconscious sense of superiority to correct their tendency towards revealing a patronizing attitude towards the members of the other race to persuade them through their intimate, spontaneous, and informal association with them of the genuineness of their friendship and the sincerity of their intention and to master their impatience of any lack of responsiveness on the part of a people who have received for so long a period such grievous and slow healing wounds let and and he uses a word that was it was written in the uh, 1930s but i'm going to say black people because that would be the more appropriate word to use now uh, let the black people through their corresponding effort on their part show by every means in their power the warmth of their response their readiness to forget the past and their ability to wipe out every trace of suspicion that may still linger in their hearts and minds let neither think that the solution of so vast a problem is a matter that exclusively concerns the other. Let neither think that such a problem can either easily or immediately be resolved. Let neither think that they can wait confidently for the solution of this problem until the initiative has been taken and the favorable circumstances created by agencies that stand outside of the orbit of their faith. Let neither think that anything short, and this is a long list, anything short of genuine love, extreme patience, true humility, consummate tact, sound initiative, mature wisdom, and deliberate, persistent, and prayerful effort can succeed in blotting out the stain which this patent evil has left on the fair name of their common country. There are many pages in the Baha'i writings that talk about racism specifically. And while all religions talk about love, all religions talk about unity, the Baha'i faith has per a prescription for today's ills that are very specific. And they're very specific with regard to racism in particular. Um, I'm so sorry for going on so long. I will oh, stop. No, okay. But, but
but I didn't do it justice. So y'all should talk more about racism specifically. <laughs> if you haven't already, maybe you have, but that's yeah, it. Yeah, we'll, no, that, that's, that's a subject for another uh, fireside. Yeah. Thanks, I appreciate that, uh, lady. I wanna call on uh, Peter Stockdale. Peter, if you could kindly unmute yourself and ask your question, thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, you've kind of anticipated me a little bit in your reply, but I'm thinking uh, that if defund the police seemed a modest proposal, what you are asking us to think about is defund the justice system. And you're, in your reply, essentially, you're saying the justice system is uh, is a rotten tree and there needs to be a good tree bearing good fruit so and i think as an american and american upper middle classes have sort of seen they their system unmasked more than ever before for them for more than they have seen so you're, you're an american does this mean uh, a good fruit looks like restorative justice? What sort of system are you proposing? I presume you're not talking about reforming the existing system, which you've talked about hasn't really worked very well. So uh, usually you don't, you can't collapse entirely one system and start from beginning very successfully. So are you thinking about a parallel system being developed or where are you going? So I will not pretend to give you a blueprint <laughs> for a new justice system. So I'm, I'm not gonna do that. Um, what, I, what I do know though, is that our justice system would, be, would have to be based on spiritual principles that are very different than what our current justice system is based on. So, you know, this idea of truth sounds simple, but it's not even a basic foundation of the current justice system that we have. So there would have to be changes that would get at, that would allow truth to actually be really important <laughs> in the justice system. And there could be procedural things done, like prosecutorial discretion with which this administration got rid of, which would have allowed for people to say, we agree on these facts, let's decide and zone in on um, things that are really at odds rather than just opposing a case for the sake of opposing a case where it's more about winning and losing and I don't care if you're right or you're wrong. To allow judges to ask questions and to not be masked and muzzled in being able to help um, arbitrate the finding of justice. We have to get rid of lawyers. And I'm, I'm that would put me out of a job, but I think like the whole design, which was rooted by the way, you know, the British uh, had this thing around jousting. Our justice system came from jousting. It's like rich people hiring people to fight for them. And we became the lawyers. So it, 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 it by, again, by its design, it was about hiring people to do your dirty work <laughs> and to argue on your behalf and to win, essentially. And again, there's, there's got to be something that changes about the whole advocacy process. Many of our underlying um, laws, I, we can talk about the U.S. Constitution. Um, I, could, I could talk to you about the Refugee Convention, which was designed in 1945 and completely eliminated women from it and gender. We've band-aided on solutions that, that in just the last six months have been completely reversed. It's all vulnerable unless we change the foundation and make sure that the foundational principles are rooted in equity, equality of women and men, equality of the races, not just about money, all of these kinds of things. So that's to preview some of those things. Um, you know, another really concrete example, if, if some of you may have seen, there's a documentary called 13th. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend. It's a great, another example of how we have had this constitution in place that was fundamentally flawed from the beginning. We grafted on an amendment to try to solve it, um, basically saying slavery is illegal, except 
if you're incarcerated, then you can be uh, sold to farmers to work their land for free. And so then we began rounding up black people for things like vagrancy and jaywalking and all kinds of ridiculous things, even as we do today, the, the mindset continues to make sure that people could be in jail so that people would work the fields because then they could still be slaves so long as they had a prison uniform on. It was baked in. It's in our constitution and in our amendment. So we have to go back and rewrite these things. And I'm not pretending it won't be easy. And maybe the best solution is parallel. I mean, when you're tearing down a house, you try to rent another one in the meantime, right? And that is maybe something that would need to happen. Rwanda is a really good example. Um, again, it's a whole nother case study that could be a whole nother evening. But after the Rwandan genocide, they eliminated the British justice system. And they incorporated their own concepts of justice. They, anyway, I, I won't go into it. It's amazing and it was run by women because that's all that was left and women run that country and they still do. And now that country is thriving, economically doing very well. And they had a very robust truth and reconciliation process. So there are many models that I think you know, we, we could look to, but that, that presents more of the issues than it does answer. But I, I, I don't pretend to have a blueprint for exactly the right. Thank you, lady. I have a couple of more questions. And I think, you know, one of the things that um, one of the cardinal principles in uh, the Baha'i writings is, is the principle of consultation. And while there are principles and frameworks and, and uh, there's also processes on that create the opportunity for great things to emerge. So when we're talking about the design of a new approach or the design of a new system, uh, it creates the environment that uh, enables the emergence of that new justice system, as opposed to a specific design of a justice system. So that's something else to consider. Um, I'm going to call on uh, Helen. Uh, if you could, Helen, I know you've been patient. Thank you. If you can uh, unmute and ask your question, and then I've got a couple of questions by text that I will share. Um, Laylee, thanks so much for tackling such a huge issue and I uh, so admire your courage because it is such a big issue and uh, um, very complex. Um, I, I think that um, for because um, these are really huge concepts um, and they are, um, when they are referred to in the Baha'i writings, um, I think for us, for all of us, whether Baha'is or, or Baha'i uh, others that are interested in uh, studying the Baha'i writings, um, I think we are at the very, very, very early stage of trying to grasp um, the meaning of, you know, some of the writings that refer to these concepts. And so I think probably a few hundred years from now, people will look at what we're saying and we, we probably seem very, very infantile uh, in terms of our understanding. So in that um, you know, relating to that, I think one of the things that um, you mentioned, um, which kind of struck me as um, something that perhaps uh, is worthy of exploring a little bit more, which is the relationship between justice and unity. Um, just as, you know, justice is a highly complex um, concept, um, I think unity is, if anything more so and i think um you know you you mentioned sort of you know when when we are trying to um you know the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity so there is a direct relationship um and 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 you mentioned that sometimes when we are trying to do justice it doesn't quite feel uh very unifying um i think that actually um a lot of what we commonly associate as the images of unity and the meaning of unity, they are just the pretense of unity. Um, and I think that um, we shouldn't, in a way, bring in those pretense to equate that with a simple unity, enforce unity um, through, through power or conformity. And, and one example, I think, um, 
you know, in, in Baha'i consultation, uh, which Bafa mentioned, which is um, a particular, uh, very mindful process of making collective decision, um, we are, the purpose of consultation is unity. And, and at the same time, there are writings that also talk about um, we need the clashes of uh, different opinions. And so you have um, consultation, which is a process that is reflective of unity and the purpose is to, to create unity. And yet at the same time, it's very much um, about truth seeking and, and it encourages um, the sharing of differences in terms of opinion. So, I mean, I think all of those things is simply to point to the fact that we really need collectively as society, as civilization, um, need to, you know, in a way, further deepen our, and, and question the meaning of both justice as well as unity and their relationship. Um, so that's one point. And the, the, the second point that I think is perhaps really worthy of um, just flagging, I think um, the, the first gentleman who, who mentioned the whole issue of um, the injustice in the context of racial injustice, um, I think the other contribution that um, the Baha'i writing probably offers um, all of us to, in a way, to, to do more research is the relationship between um, power and, and justice as well as unity. Because I think the very first day that Baha'u'llah declared his mission, the very first thing that he said was, in this day, we are abolishing the, the, the sword. And instead, we are going to use the tongue and the pen um, to, to, to change people's heart. Um, so, so what does that mean in terms of specifically in relation to to the legal system and the justice system. Um, I think those are really, really good questions that I think it would be great if, if you know, this session would inspire others to look into it more. And, and so once again, I thank you for sharing your thoughts and your research and your experience. And this is a huge topic that I'm sure like it will occupy us for many, many more, um, you know, centuries. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Helen. I'm going to uh, call on Cheshmak. Uh, Cheshmak, if you could uh, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Leili John, so much for that thought-provoking presentation, for the invitation, dear Gisu and Vafa, and uh, so lovely, really, to see so many uh, friends uh, tonight. Um, the question that I wanted to ask Lady John has to do with individual action. You've given us lots of things to think about. Um, in our neighborhood here in Ottawa, in our community, uh, there's, you know, a few of us who've taken upon ourselves to try and raise awareness um, and to try and be the solution. Uh, we're doing that in the neighborhood, in the school, um, and a friend who's on this call, Rudy, and I are some of this work um, in our workplace as well at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, what are some thoughts you have about doing this work effectively in a way that helps people understand the historical and social roots of the injustice, like the way that you described that the tree is flawed at its core, the system is flawed, and that it's, it was created essentially to uphold patriarchy and, you know, and white supremacy. How do we do that in a loving way, uh, in a way that enables us to, to trans, be transformative? Um, and you know, I, I just wanted to get some thoughts from you because we're trying to do this work at so many levels and some of us are on this call tonight and and so um we'd love your thoughts and then we can go back and chat about it and and do some more stuff in in our spaces and also on an individual level you know i hear a lot of my black friends talking about how you know us white and white passing people must take ownership of this history and truly really try and understand um, how those privileges also you know benefit us so that then we can, humbled from that perspective, begin to be part of the change that we can be. 
Um, it's a great question. I, I think we're very blessed to not only be living in a time where awareness is more keen, but where there are a ton of resources. So, you know, just really in the last five years, there have been many books written and many documentaries and, and podcasts and all kinds of things. Um, and so I, um, I can laundry list a few that, that would be helpful. I don't know if somebody wants to type them in the notes so that people can see if you're familiar with these resources, I'd be grateful. Maybe that way others can find them. But, you know, I, I mean, I think um, if I mentioned the documentary 13th, that's very, very useful. There's a podcast called Seeing White, Seeing White. And it's a brilliant podcast because it allows us to see uh, the supremacy and the, the normativeness of whiteness in a way that when you're swimming in it as a white person, it's very hard to objectively see. Um, there's a book called White Fragility, which I think is many people do know about. It is It should be required reading, I think, for most white and white passing people. Um, uh, also, How to Be an Anti-Racist is another book. It has a Cliff Notes version. There is a workshop version of How to Be an Anti-Racist, which may be um, good for some people. You can do it in community. You can do it with, and it's very specific, how to be an anti-racist. It really, really goes into great detail um, about what people can do there is a lot that we should do to educate ourselves, particularly so that people of color and black people don't have to educate us. There's an exhaustion and an injustice um, by asking other people to do work we should be doing ourselves. There's a book called Stamped, um, which is, it's thick, but it's really worth reading. There's a youth version, which is shorter, I'm told. So you could read the youth version or you could read the adult version. Um, there's also a podcast series by the New York Times called 1619, which is about the slave trade. And again, that's a global thing, right? So um, history of Haiti is discussed in that podcast and a number of other things. And that's also a very valuable resource in order to, um, oh, thank you so much for those of you who are putting in the comments. Um, Gosh, there are a lot, there are a lot. So, you know, now is the time to double down in self-education um, and, and to, to really, you know, and, and even kind of connect with other maybe white, white passing people um, so that, that our black friends aren't burdened emotionally. It, it, it is traumatic to have to relive. And it's also frustrating to have to ex explain and re-explain and kind of prove your own experience. And so um, again and again, we're told that, that really it's so helpful if white and white passing people can lead the charge in educating other white and white passing people. Particularly um, if, if one is a newly arrived immigrant to the United States, there's a whole history and a huge difference between coming to a country as a slave versus coming as a refugee voluntarily or coming as an immigrant voluntarily. Those are very different experiences that we should also really understand, as well as all of the insidious systemic things that are done in order to maintain racism through our incarceration system, our financing, banking, and loan system, um, hiring unconscious bias that exists, our entertainment system images that we've been fed, it, 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 as Shogi Effendi says, it has bitten into the moral fabric and all the institutions that we're swimming in and living in. Um, and so to look at that in the eye and do that work is really, really valuable. Um, I think, I, I, I don't know, you know, all those books will give better information. Um, the only maybe additional thing I would add is that as we engage in trying to understand ourselves, trying to understand the society that we lived in, I think we should expect at least two things. We should expect a lot of effort and time because we've all been lied to. If you went to school in Canada or in the United States, you were not told the accurate history. You weren't. And so there's literally years of education that has to, we have to catch up 
and undo learning and redo learning. So don't expect to watch one movie. Don't expect to listen to one podcast and then get it. And, and like, oh, now you're, you're perfectly educated. It, it will take a tremendous amount of work and literal hours to educate. So expect that. The other thing is expect to feel super uncomfortable um, and expect to screw up and then feel really uncomfortable about how you screwed up <laughs> and how you are told that you have screwed up and then get back up again and try again. Completely expect that. Expect imperfection, expect hard work, and do not expect appreciation because just learning what we should know doesn't deserve appreciation and doing the right thing isn't about appreciation. But some people enter the arena of understanding racism and engaging in anti-racism work with an expectation that this will be affirming, it will feel good, it will be easy, and I will be appreciated. Just put all that out and know that none of that's gonna happen. Yeah, thank you. But it will be thank the right <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, great questions. There, there's, um, there's more questions. I, it's uh, 9.30. It's time uh, for us, as we said in the invitation, to conclude. I know we can keep going and going, and, and uh, um, I hope that uh, we'll have the opportunity to invite uh, Lely again uh, to share her thoughts. This is obviously a very important subject. I mean, the one thing that um, uh, got to me was um, uh, a lot about being getting engaged. So I, I appreciate uh, that point. Uh, Marty asked a question, one of the questions on the text. I think we'll, we'll go for a few minutes longer um, and, and uh, conclude in a bit. Uh, but Marty asked, um, I'm a mediator wondering what Laylee thinks about the role of restorative justice processes. Um, I'm just, okay, sorry, I just wrote another resource on there for people. So um, I love restorative justice. I think it's an amazing, amazing process. Um, and for those of you who, who aren't familiar, restorative justice is basically a process by which after there's justice, so there's been punishment, there's been recognition of the harm, there has been discernment of the truth, there has been punishment. Um, it, the the um, restorative justice process is kind of what happens after that. And it's beautiful because it's addressing exactly this issue that we're not done when there's punishment, there's more work to be done. Um, it's, it's rooted in the church. It's rooted in Christianity. Um, uh, Christians have been leading the effort around restorative justice. And um, there are several models. There are lots of different models for restorative justice. But um, just to maybe illustrate one, the idea is that, and it's very, you know, survivor specific, if the survivor decides that they want restorative justice, um, somebody who is trained in restorative justice works with the survivor as well as the perpetrator so that the perpetrator is able to hear the harm apologize ask for forgiveness hear the impact and the implications of what they did um, and then the survivor is also able to forgive um, say their truth all within relative safety i say relative safety because there's nothing 100 percent safe emotionally about doing that but within some boundaries that make that as productive constructive and safe for everybody as possible and that it allows for that dialogue you know for a survivor of violence having her perpetrator being put in jail is good but it may not be enough that's not that that may not be what justice looks like for her it may be, and it is often true for a lot of survivors, that to look their perpetrator in the eye and say, you did this to me and I need you to recognize it. And I need you to know what it did, the implications. And I need you to hear me and I need you to see that. And I need you to apologize for that. That's gonna be justice for me. And that's gonna allow healing and restitution 
and restoration, the release of fear and eventual unity. And so the restorative justice movement is about having all that happen. And then similarly, for the perpetrator who's living in a hell, I mean, you know, being a perpetrator of violence is a corrosive thing on one's soul. This allows for the possibility of redemption and the possibility of transformation. And so it, it's a beautiful, beautiful process. And I, I'm so glad that uh, it was brought up. Yeah, these are wonderful in the chat. I'm seeing the examples, it's wonderful. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Oh, hey, there's a lot of great stuff coming on the chat. Mm -hmm. um, so one, one uh, question someone has um, mentioned, they've just recently become familiar with the concept of transformative justice. I'm, I'm not familiar with it. Um, and uh, so the, the, the question is whether um, that you, it's possible for the current uh, punitive justice system to be replaced by transformative justice as distinct from uh, restorative justice. You know, I think the examples that are being brought up are wonderful examples of alternatives. And there was an earlier question that asked about what might a justice system look like. Um, and we're seeing example, you know, I mentioned Rwanda, but there, there is a transformative justice, there's restorative justice, there's mediation, particularly when it's about commercial, you know, a lot of courts, and I used to work for a big corporate law firm, and, and I'm directly, was directly responsible for some of this. The courts are gummed up by a lot of people just trying to win over each other to make more money. It's not really about justice, you know, and, and it's like, get, let's deal with those over here. And, <laughs> you know, there are different ways. Um, you know, I think the bottom line is that a new design, a new justice system will have to be based on spiritual principles. And it will have to be designed by people who have been most marginalized and who know most what it is like to not be able to access it. And that will be the true blueprint for a better justice system. But restorative justice, in fact, um, uh, restorative justice was designed by an ex-con, somebody who had gotten out of prison and kind of said, this isn't, we're not done. <laughs> this isn't true justice and designed the restorative justice process. Um, transformative justice has been designed by marginalized communities. And so again, I, I think the, the brilliance and the wisdom and the, the, the true change and healing that we need and the way we fix our justice system will be guided by spiritual principles and marginalized communities. I have faith in that. That's a pretty, pretty powerful and strong uh, point. I think it's a good place for us to uh, end the session this evening and reflect. And as we all go away, obviously there's things that we can talk about, engaging conversations in our own communities and our own circles. Um, we, we've thought about the idea of at some point, maybe we'll, we'll have breakout uh, rooms on Zoom. But uh, Lady, I wanted to thank you very much for sharing your Sunday evening with us, uh, sharing your uh, thoughts and uh, your experiences, your insights um, is very much appreciated. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody who participated um, in this. In, in case you were wondering, we were at the peak, we were at uh, 79 connections. So probably somewhere over, over 85 or so people were participating. Um, so thank you, everybody. I, I, I don't know where everybody is. I, I know Arizona is, is there. I know obviously Toronto is there. I know Ottawa is there. I know um, New York is there. Uh, okay, I, I'm throwing in Aurora and Richmond Hill as Toronto. Okay, so don't, don't worry if you're living outside. But I especially again want to thank Fadia all the way from Jordan uh, joining her. She's a trooper. She participates all the time in early hours. So. Uh, thank you, everybody. I should let you know that if uh, we have a opt-in 
uh, email distribution. You're, you're not going to get added to a distribution of our invitations unless you request it. So I am going to put uh, my email address in the text message if you're interested to receive the invitations to the firesides um, on a regular basis please feel free uh, to uh, send me your email address to my email address or stay in contact with the person that extended the invitation because they're going to be receiving the uh, invitation anyway. Um, I hope I didn't miss anything. Again, thank you very much, Laili. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating. Um, have a uh, nice rest of the weekend. Please stay safe and healthy uh, and engage. That's uh, perhaps the most important part of this is figure out how we can engage in the process of transforming um, our uh, myself, uh, participating in transformation of my family and and uh, certainly the community. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care.